Hi, Bob Canote, Camp Chaos Chronicles. And what I'd like to do today on this episode of the Camp Chaos Cars is to introduce you to my favorite old girl here, my 1978 Jaguar XJ6. Dang it. Now I know I've said this about my other cars, but this really is my favorite car because I bought it in 1998 at a time of my life where I really kind of needed a project and I really got it because it, uh, it needed some work. In fact, I had to do a lot of uh, rust repair on it and eventually I ended up painting it uh, my first serious paint job, which turned out awful, but there is such a thing as wet or dry sandpaper. And by virtue of that, it's what you see here today. And it's good enough for people to walk up to me at gas stations and say, wow, that car is perfect. Which it's not. They're just seeing an old Jaguar. But anyway, not only the paint, but also I had to overhaul the engine eventually. That was about 2005. Just prior to that, I had to overhaul the transmission, uh, and there's just been a lot of other things that I've had to do. But like I said, that was a time in my life where I needed to have something to focus on, a good project, and this was it. So this little girl has been to uh, Monterey uh, Motorsports Reunion out in California. That's a 2,000-mile road trip, 4, 000, almost 5,000 miles round trip. Not trouble-free, but she got me home. Well, kind of. More on that later. Before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about the history of the XJ series of, uh, of Jaguars. The XJ first came out in 1968, and that was at a time where they had a fairly broad product line. They had the E-Type, they had the 420G, they had, I believe they had the Mark 10 at that point, and also the Mark II, I think was still in production at that point. So they had a lot on their plate. The car first came out in its original form, as I said, in 1968. Came out with the 4.2 liter inline six cylinder engine, which this car has. And uh, that engine has been in production since 1947, I believe, was when the, uh, the first Jaguar vehicle came out, the XK120. Also, in 1972, was offered with the 5.3 liter V12 engine, which the car was always designed to have, a V12. They just hadn't gotten around to designing it in its final form until, until the early 1970s. And uh, it was a tight fit, but it worked. And it was a pretty darn good engine. The car was extended four inches in wheelbase starting in 1972 for the long wheelbase version or the XJ6 or an XJ12L. But it was still offered concurrently with the original. And in 1973, the Series 2 came out. It was still offered with the 4.2 and 5.3 liter engines. The short wheelbase and long wheelbase versions were offered concurrently until 1974, at which time the only thing that was offered was the long wheelbase because they weren't selling the shorties anymore. Up to that point, the engine was offered only with carburetors, both the V12s and the six-cylinder engines. In 1975, the XJ12 got fuel injection. And the reason for that was the XJS, which is the two-door uh, sport coupe uh, came out and it was offered with a fuel injected V12 engine and it was a good engine it uh, and it stayed in production in various forms until 1996 I believe in 1975 the XJ6 
got fuel injection, which is what this one has right here. And from that point on, of course, they were all fuel injected. Another interesting model that came out in 1975 was the XJ6 and XJ12C. And what that was is a two-door coupe and a very, very attractive car, very highly sought after. This only stayed in production from 1975 to 1978, and there was 10,500 of them made total. So if you're looking for a rare Jaguar, an XJ6C or an XJ12C is your candidate. I think it might even be more rare than an E-Type, although they're much more affordable. In 1979, the Series 3 came out, and the Series 3 was a Pininfarina redesign, Pininfarina being a styling studio in Italy that designed top-end cars like Ferraris, Maseratis, and that sort of thing. And the main visual cues, if you're looking at one of these cars as to whether it's a Series 2 or 3, is the fact that what they did was to raise the rear roof line a little bit and sort of block it off somewhat, uh, increase the size of the rear window. The taillights were redesigned from the tombstone upright style that we have on this car to sort of a, an odd shaped or a, I don't know what the geometric form would be, but it's definitely different than the series one and two. So there's no question as to which is which. Another thing is, it no longer had the refrigerator style door handles. Uh, they were more flush mounted like the XJ40s. And the XJ6 stayed in production until 1987 when it was replaced by the XJ40. However, the XJ12 stayed in production until 1992. And uh, at that point then they finally put it to bed and it was all XJ40 from that point on. Let's do a little bit of a walk around and see some of the interesting things that Jaguar did when they designed it and also some of the things I had to do in order to get it to where it is today, which is a pretty, pretty impressive, honest old girl. That's not perfect, but it, it works. The first thing is the fuel tanks. This is different than any other vehicle that I'm aware of. A lot of airplanes have this, but as far as I know, no other car has it. And that is this, a fuel tank right here with a little aircraft style cap on it, which is not in and of itself a big deal. But if you look over there, you got two of them. There's two 12 gallon tanks, one in this fender and one in that over there. Truth is, there's probably enough room underneath the uh, the rear panel and the interior of the car in order to put a 24 gallon tank, but they did it this way, which is really kind of cool. You've got a selector valve in the trunk on the floor that you can select the right or left tank, just like in your Spitfire. So uh, that's kind of cool. I know this one thing here right now, my antenna is missing. That fell off yesterday. Easy enough, I'll get another one. Now, if you look at the, the rear bumper on this thing, there's uh, the outside, the outriggers are just about perfect. It's starting to pit a little bit here, but you know what? That's patina. That's the way I like it. You can also see that the bumpers, the finish on the bumpers are cracking. That was first painted in the year 2000. So it's about time for a redo. Now, as far as repairs on this car is concerned, what I had to do is replace the valance underneath that panel that the exhaust pipes come through, which was not easy, but again, in the context of the times when I needed a project, perfect. Now on this side, this was also gone. The person that had painted the car originally was a real artist with, with automotive body filler. This, when I got it, looked just as good as it looks now. Except that within a year, started to get some bubbling, and I found that this whole thing was just perforated with rust. So uh, I got some repair panels, and it was true on the other side as well, and welded that in here. So these two patches, plus that balance in the back, were the major body issues that I had with the car. Now you can see that the interior 
is reasonably good. It's got, uh, got some wear on it, and we can see that on the other side there's a split that's starting to happen, which would be easy enough to fix. But uh, other than that, it looks pretty darn good. Any wear on it, again, it's patina, and that's how I like it. Front seats, pretty much the same thing, except for the driver's seat. You can see I've got a cheap seat cover on it that uh, hides the tears in it, and that's, you know, that's common on any old car that's been used to any extent. Dash pad is good. All the wood, there's a few cracks in it, but again, that's kind of how I like it. Up front here, as I said, I had the engine overhauled. I did that in my shop. I used to be a teacher, so I did it uh, during the winter time when I was, uh, when I was sort of had a little bit of downtime from the farming. Uh, also eventually ended up with the, tr the transmission overhaul as well. This fender was good. The one on the other side is kind of interesting because in the front, in front of the front wheel, as I was doing the body work on it, there was a big lump of asphalt where the car had been driven through a construction area where they were repaving. And so I took a screwdriver and pried it out and it fell on the floor and there was a patch of white paint on it about that big. So what had happened was the person that repainted the car ground it flat, primed it, and painted it. So I had to do a little repair work there. The, uh, the front bumper is pretty much the same as the rear bumper. The grill is close enough to perfect for me. Motifs starting to show a little paint flaking off, but that's, again, kind of how I like it. Now you can see that this car was painted 20 years ago, and we're starting to get some things like this right down here, starting to come through. And this up here, there's a rock chip, and I did a little bit too much sanding on it, so that needs to be repaired. And there's little rust bubbles here and there on it, but you know what? She's a pretty honest old girl, not trying to be anything that she's not. She's not a hanger queen. She gets, she gets driven every year. One thing I just noticed right here, I forgot about this last fall when I put the car away. I was driving down a four-lane highway here, and I was following a pickup truck. He hit a bump, and a ton of gravel came out from underneath. Several rock chips up front, and I lost the windshield. One other thing, you can see right here, these tires uh, are a couple sizes too big, but I like that. It gives it a more masculine look. The original tire size is really pretty skinny, so... Um, I think it's a nice addition. Although the speedometer does read five miles per hour high at 60 miles an hour. But that's the sort of thing you keep track of. Well, there it is. I think it's time we go drive this thing. favorite little road within 30 miles of my house. It's kind of technical in the sense that there's a lot of turns and elevation changes and it's just a lot of fun to drive and when I'm driving a different car it's always fun to take it down here to get my first impressions. First of all let's say that this is a 1970s luxury sedan. So it's not going to handle like a sports car. It's not going to be real fast because that wasn't the point. But I got to say that it does the driving thing pretty darn well. The turn in is real crisp. The, there's no ambiguity around a corner, no bump steer to speak of front and rear. Although you got to you got to say that. Uh, 
that in order to really understand a car like this, you've got to be driving it closer to the limit than I will be doing here today. So, got a few gawkers here. But, uh, no, it, it does a real good job of being a luxury sedan. And, uh, I'd like to take it on more extended trips than I do. I'd like to go through the northeastern United States during fall. It would be a great, great vehicle to do that with. Uh, it does tend to overheat just a little bit. Right now it's 80 degrees out and it's pretty much in the normal range, but any hotter than that, it gets to be a little bit of a problem. Best example of that is a story that I'd like to tell about when I took this car to Monterey for the motorsport reunion there. I was part of a team that builds an E-Type for the 50th anniversary reunion. And uh, it was okay until we got on the other side of Rapid City be living in the center of Minnesota and the temperature started to get around 80, 90 degrees and um, the temperature gauge began to climb higher and higher and it was obvious the thing was starting to heat. But it was manageable until I got to northern Nevada and at that point then the temperature got to 102 degrees and the temperature gauge hovered just under the hot range for the rest of the trip until I got to um, just about northern northern California. And at that point it began to cool off and it was not a problem again. But uh, having experienced the same thing with an actual temperature gauge, a master gauge attached, I was running 220 degrees for most of that day. However, it was great once I got to California, enjoyed Monterey, but on the way home, it got hot enough in northern Nevada at Elko where I refueled, the transmission wouldn't shift. So I figured, well, I'll cook the transmission. As luck would have it, the team was coming up behind with the, with the van and they had an extra spot. They picked me up. And I got a ride all the way back to Minnesota in luxury in the motorhome. When I got back to Minnesota, I figured, well, we'll just see what happens if I try to try to start this thing. Started it up, backed it off the trailer. It was perfect, and it's been perfect ever since. In fact, I got to say, the transmission seems to shift a little smoother since that experience. And I thought, sure, I cooked the engine. In fact, just a couple years ago, I did have to redo the cylinder head gasket, which I attribute to that trip. So I didn't come, come away completely unscathed, but uh, I sort of attribute the fact that I didn't kill the engine to the fact that I used an oil treatment called Prolong, which is almost 100% zinc from what I'm told. And uh, I use that in all my old engines, which means all of them. So it's, uh, I'm a firm believer in it. I saw Al Unser on an infomercial one time drive, drive a Dodge Viper on a race course with no oil in the crankcase. And it came out the other side good as new. And Al wouldn't lie to me. Great day on the highway up here, filming this episode many, many times up and back, along with a lot of motorcyclists, some of them the same motorcyclists. I was kind of surprised. Got kind of hot toward the end of the day, 88 degrees, and under most circumstances, this thing would be heating a little bit, but it really, for the most part, stayed between the N and the L on normal on the temperature gauge, so it behaved himself very, very well. So if you like this video and you want to see more, 
like us, subscribe, follow us on social media, and we'll see you the next time on the Camp Chaos Chronicles.